Uh, good afternoon and uh, welcome to lesson number 19 where we shall uh, discuss, we shall continue to discuss sequence control. Today we will discuss a CAM cycle that is a CAM is a program execution. So we will discuss how programs are cyclically executed and we will discuss the nature of its impact on performance. And we'll also discuss how to write some simple uh, relay ladder logic programs. So, uh, as usual, we view the instructional objectives first. After today's lesson, one should be able to describe a typical program scan cycle, that is, describe what takes place, how the program works cyclically. would be able to explain the impact of this kind of execution on the control performance, typically on the fastness of response, that is how fast the uh, programmable logic controller responds to changes in input with changes in output. Then we will go on to describe the basic elements of a typical relay ladder logic program. Today we will look at the very simple elements of the program and in future lectures we shall go on to see more advanced programming elements. And finally, we will take two of the simplest examples and see how exactly a relay ladder logic program, uh, program segment could look like and also would learn to interpret a particular RLL program. That is, uh, after we if we are given an RLL program, then we have to know how, what it means and how the inputs and outputs will change with time. So, we will do that. So, that is the agenda today. Having said that, we continuing on the same note from the last lesson. If you recall, in the last lesson, we had uh, ended at a point when we had listed some of the hardware elements of a PLC system, namely backplane, CPU, memory, the different I.O. modules, wiring, programmer, uh, man-machine interface, etc. So today, we take a software focus and start looking at how the basic program execution goes in a PLC. So this one Obviously, in, in like in most control programs, a PLC program also works cyclically. So, as it happens, so basically, these are actually, uh, so this is one view, say view A. In view A, the we are, we, are, we, are, we are indicating that the program simply works cyclically. So, this program which is a, which is a set of statements execute cyclically. That is the execution begins here, then next statement and so on till the last statement and then again the first statement will be executed. Now, what happens within this overall program box? That is, what are the functions which are carried out in the program? So, as we, as we all know that PLCs are real-time embedded systems. They are, they are reactive in the sense that they accept input from the external world and produce outputs which go to the external world, namely the machine. So, obviously, the program has to be always aware of what changes are taking place in the external world, namely the various variables that are being controlled in the machine. So, a typical program cycle includes three steps. First is, so this is a, an expanded view of A, namely B, which shows that typically three activities take place during a program execution. So, for the first one is 
read all input. Mark the stress on all, which means that it is not that, so initially it means that initially all the inputs are read one after the other and their values are stored and then the, then the execution of the logic begins. So this is a major difference with, a, with any standard program which you could write in a microprocessor. In a microprocessor you could write a, you could write a program where the various processing statements addition, subtraction, multiplication, comparison, whatever you have, you could intersperse them with the input and the output statements. But typically in a, in PLC execution that does not take place. So in PLC, because presumably because of the fact that initially the, the PLC programs, you know, there is a good, there is always a stress on keeping things simple so that errors do not occur. So at the cost of some flexibility of programming, we are intending to uh, achieve some simplicity and, and that, is, that is a sound strategy provided performance is not affected. And in this case, it happens that, you know, typical microprocessors uh, statement execution times run in microseconds, while with PLCs, the kind of things that we are trying to control are either mechanical or thermal or chemical. So the time constants are usually so large that this subtle difference between reading all the inputs at, at one time makes hardly any effect. So therefore, typically for PLCs, all inputs are read at one shot in the beginning. At the beginning of the scan cycle, one cycle of these three steps would be called a scan cycle. After all inputs are read, the program logic gets executed. Now during the execution of the program logic, various outputs are produced. So it so happens that as outputs are produced, they are written to some temporary memory, but, but just like inputs are read at the same time, similarly, it's not, it's not that uh, whenever some outputs are produced and some output values are stored in memory, they would be, they would be going to the external world. That does not happen. So after all the logic of the program is executed, at the end, all the uh, outputs are output values which go to the external world in the sense of, you know, various switches, motor starters, lamps, indications, they are all, they are all updated at the end of the cycle and then the cycle repeats, namely the next cycle of inputs are read. So this is the, this is the typical way that a PLC programs can take place. And so C, C is a kind of, shows the kind of memories that are used in the PLC system. So you have four kinds of memories. First you have what is known as program memory, where the logic program is stored. That is the first one. Then you have what is known as an input image. So when the inputs are read, they are for the, for the program logic evaluation, these input values will have to be read from time to time during the evaluation of the logic. So therefore, they have to be necessarily stored in memory. So where the input values are stored is called an input image. So this is the second use of the memory. Similarly, as outputs are produced, as the logic gets computed, outputs are produced and they have to be stored till the time that they can be transferred to the external world. So for that, the output image memory is used. And as we know that for all computation, we need, some, we, need, we need certain, in addition to the input and output variables, we need certain temporary variables, which are, you know, so for storing these things, we need some, some other additional memory. So this shows how the overall memory available in a PLC system is used. Right. Having understood that, 
we have to understand that uh, this kind of a program execution ma we we are we in this in this figure we are what we are trying to show is that many times it will happen that it will happen that the if you if you let's 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 first look at the if you understand if you have to understand this diagram before that we have to understand a typical you know plc hardware organization so what happens is that in a plc the various units this we did not discuss in the earlier lesson so the various units are actually organized as modules so you have what is known as you know racks so this is one module similarly th there could be another module by the side of it so this is one module this is another module similarly so this could be a this could be the main processor module similarly this could be an analog io module input module let us say Similarly, you can have digital input, digital out, various kinds of modules. So, what happens often is that, so now, you see, this, this processor, the, the, the external variables, that is the various signals, get interfaced to these modules. And similarly, this could be a digital output module. So what happens is that these external signals are, these modules are again self-independent, they are, they, are, they are as such independent circuit boards. So they often have processors on them. So what happens is that the, the, the processor here, the processor here actually what happens is that, you know, here is a board, suppose we are taking, so you have all the circuitry here. In this side, the physical signals are interfaced. Physical or field signals. And on this side, the this so these are physical signals, and on this side, symbolically, maybe in a buffer, this is a buffer, the values of these signals are stored. So when the processor module reads an input, it's not that it, it reads these physical signals. It actually reads these buffer values, which are st stored, which are continuously kept in the buffers by the I.O. card, right? So, and this I.O. card often work under the control of the processor. It may work at the control of the processor or it may continuous or, or it may work independently cyclically itself, right? So all these I.O. cards are actually there, there is a, there is what is known as, that's what we refer to in, 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 in our earlier lecture as a, as a, as a backplane or a bus, backplane or bus, which is nothing but a set of conductors to which all of these are connected. So, when I say that a, that, a, that a processor reads an input, it actually reads these buffer values over the bus. So, actually two activities keep on taking place. The first one is that the physical signals keep getting transformed from uh, either to these buffers and these, these buffers could be physically situated either on the card or it could even be situated in the processor memory. So it may so happen, those who have studied microprocessors will, will understand this, that it may so happen that these cards every few units of time convert these values and then using some interrupt mechanism, they will transfer these values to some part of the processor memory. So wh what I'm trying to stress is that here there are two kinds of cycles going on. One kind of cycle continuously cyclically 
samples the physical inputs and transforms them to a part of the memory which we call the IO image. And the processor when it reads, it actually reads from that image, right. Now, so having understood this, so what, what is happening is that, so you see these are the various racks, these are the various racks, so these are the IO racks, this could be an analog in, this could be an, uh, this could be an analog input, similarly this could be a digital output, various kinds of things. So there is a scanning mechanism which goes on which continuously updates either reads from the rack depending if it is an input rack or writes to a rack from a part of the memory. This memory can be at the scanner, can be at the cards, at the various places, okay. While the, while the main PLC program scanning actually reads these IO images, from this IO image it actually stores, reads the input. And whenever it actually produces output, it, it also writes to this IO image and so it keeps writing to this IO image and then finally uh, they, they get transferred to the rack. So this is how the, the, the basic activities go on in a PLC. So now we have to see that what is the result of these activities, this, this kind of scan, scanning, what kind of response, what kind of impact it has on the, on the various input and output updating. Typically, we are interested to know how much of delay we can expect in responding to an input change. So imagine that this is a, there, there could be a best case and there could be a worst case. So we are first looking at the best case. So what could happen is that the, remember that the, that the, that the plant input can change at any arbitrary period of time. We cannot control that, right. So suppose the plant input changes just before an in, the inputs are read. So then immediately after it changes, it will be read that is this change will be reflected and will come to the processor IO image very quickly. Then, then the while the program will be, well, while, while the program will be executed, then in computing the output value, the latest change of the input value will be taken care of, will be accounted for. So, Possibly due to this input change at the end of the execution, there will be an output change. Now since it may actually happen, suppose this is the ith statement. This is the ith statement that is the effect of, the, of this input is used to compute some output at the ith logical statement. So then what will happen is that during execution, here is the, this is the point where the ith statement gets executed. So actually in the processor memory, the output changes at this point of time. However, it, it does not go to the physical world till the whole program execution has completed as we have said. So therefore the output the physical, the physical output which goes to the process gets affected only at that time and there is a, this is the amount of delay that is bound to occur. So there is a, the best case response time is the delay of one scan which depends on many factors like the speed of the PLC execution also the length of the uh, RLL program, etc. This is the best case. It is called the best case because the input was, the, because the input was read immediately after it changed. So there was no delay in sensing the change in the input. In the next case, as we shall show, 
that you shall see the worst case where this is just the opposite oh. so this is the opposite this is the worst case so what is happening here here unfortunately the input has changed just after a, a reading cycle was completed so therefore this change of the input was not sensed by the plc in this scan cycle in this scan cycle it it could it did not sense that the input has changed so therefore it computed by this time it had it had computed and sent out the outputs once but however those outputs did not reflect the new value of input which occurred just after the input in the in this cycle took place so, so that is why it is the worst case so it occurred so there is a there is a maximum possible delay however at this point at this point in the second scan cycle the inputs will be read again and this time this this change is going to be sensed and now after this after having sensed this there will be again be one cycle of delay so therefore the worst case of delay is two scan cycles so that is why depending on the kind of response time you one has to decide based on an application whether such delay times are acceptable or not. So we shall see that in certain cases uh, these such delay times may not be acceptable in which case you have to take additional measure in the sense that you might put additional cards or uh, additional hardware for taking care of them. So this is a case where you get very fast pulses and one has to count those pulses. So in this case what we see is that suppose the scans the one scan time is this much. If we have to count a the the number of pulses which are arriving on a pulse train, typically such pulses come from uh, shaft angle encoders. If we have to count them using the PLC itself, then if the we can see that if the pulse trains are slow enough, that is, the pulse widths are sufficient, then for this for this width of the pulse train all the level changes will be sensed. So we are essentially going to count the, the, the number of pulses by counting the number of level transitions. So then our count is going to be correct and if we compute the speed based on that the value of speed we get is going to be correct. And so will be our control. On the other hand, if we increase the speed, in which case the pulses will be of shorter duration and they will arrive faster. So we will see that most of them are being still being sensed while suddenly one pulse is missed. So you see that the program was scanned for this pulse, the program when the program scanned it, the, the value was 0. And when the program scanned it next, the value was again 0. And so the program assumed that, that it remained 0. So, so one that it went up to 1 in between and came down is, is not will be, I mean the program will be unaware of that. And therefore, there, there will be uh, perhaps a small delay in the computation of the speed. If you have faster pulses coming out, still faster, then many, many such pulses will be missed. For example, this one, this one, this one. So it will be more of a chance to see when, for example, this pulse will be counted. This pulse will be counted. So you will get, you know, you will get drastic. For example, in this pulse, actually what will be inferred when it, when it was sensed here, it, it, it was 1. When it is sensed here, it is also 1. So therefore, it will be assumed that it continued at 1. So the inferred pulse is going to be, in this case, the pulse count will be severely wrong. 
so it will assume that it has continued here and then it, it, it is continuing here and then it is continuing here and then it is continuing at this point it is right. So, so the count will be a small fraction of the real speed and we are going to be totally out. It is actually for this reason that for counting fast pulses you cannot use the PLC itself but rather use a special card. So that card does not have the, the, the purpose of that card is solely to count the pulses coming from such a fast uh, shaft angle encoder. It is, no, it is not loaded with any other task. So therefore it can really sample that line very fast and therefore can, can compute the speed and the speed can be made available to the PLC in terms of a value. So rather than the PLC counting the pulses, somebody else will count the pulse and we will convert it to a value which the PLC will read from time to time. So it is for such reasons that sometimes you know special functional modules like as I as we mentioned in the earlier class that some sometimes special you know uh, high speed counter cards are needed it is for this purpose. So we go move on and we look at the We look at the predecessor of a PLC. Actually, you, as we have said, that PLCs just before the PLCs were uh, invented or made out of microprocessors, uh, such sequence control problems used to be typically ta tackled using uh, using control panels, which typically employed you know things like uh, relays. Uh, contactors, various kinds of switches, uh, lamps, uh, various kinds of you know electromechanical timers and such things. So they were actually physical devices which were hardwired. So they were typically arranged for you know ease of maintenance and, and, and installation etc. They were typically arranged modularly. So the typical arrangement would be that there will be a positive voltage bus bar and there will be a negative voltage bus bar and you will implement a particular logic that is you will here you will implement basically a network which is a series or parallel network series or parallel of various kinds of switches. So under only certain specific conditions of these switches this there will be a connection from this point to this point otherwise under other conditions this this these two ends will not be connected. So when they are not connected the voltage will not appear here and therefore current will not flow and so whatever this output is this is sometimes used to be called an output coil because they were typically physical devices like solenoids or motor starter coils. So they are typically coils so they are sometimes called output coils it's a it's a it, it's a legacy they are they are still sometimes called output coils so then the current will actually flow through this so it is therefore by this switch network you can actually control you have control the situations under which this output is going to be excited so this is the way things were made and when plcs were made initially see you can always make a new device but it's relatively more difficult to change the uh, training and the mindset of the people who use them. So just you know respecting the uh, background of the practicing engineers, the PLC program, the PLCs are nothing but microprocessor based systems. So if you see essentially PLC programs are nothing but assembly language programs. However, just so that people can write them and people can interpret them better without making mistakes. So therefore, a graphical kind of programming language was evolved and it was used to so that the engineers could think in terms of relays and then using some tool such, such pictures, such relay connection pictures could be transformed to an assembly language. So that is why programmers have to be used to convert such graphical programming language which resemble relay uh, ladder logic, physical relay ladder logic 
and they actually get kind of you know compiled into an into, into an assembly language program or, or, a, or, a, or, a, or a machine language program and they run on the PLC. So, so the kinds of PLC programs that we will see they are also they will also be organized like relay ladder while there is no real relay here. So, we will draw these power rails which are virtual because this is entirely an abstraction and each one of those, each one of these program statements will be called a rung. So, there are, so actually these relay ladder logic programs are nothing but a series of rungs having between two rails which are virtual. So, the left part of the rung is a, is a, is a, is a network of the various ladder logic elements like various kinds of contacts, timers, etcetera and followed by an output coil which shows under what conditions that output is going to be excited. So, this is the way we are going to draw them. So, coming to the, <coughs> so now we have to understand, so you see that how the PLC program will be, will be executed. So, one after the other starting from the top after the inputs are read, program execution is simply executing the logic of the rungs, evaluating the output values from the top one after the other. So, typical program flow is from the, from the top, these are individual rungs, individual rungs Now, you have several logics and they are all executed between one input read and output write, uh, output read. So, it may appear to you that in what order you are going to put these logics one after the other is actually immaterial, it makes no difference, but it does. For example, imagine that you are, you know sometimes what happens is that you, if a, when there is a very complex logic, then you sometimes break up that logic into several parts. So, what happens is that initially you, you evaluate one some small part of the logic, you, you, you compute some value, then you use that value and you put it in another expression and then evaluate something else. So, it may happen that finally, we want to compute the final output. The final output can be computed based on some intermediate result D which can be computed in terms of some inter intermediate result C, which can be computed in terms of B, which can be computed in terms of A and finally, the input finally, A can be computed in terms of the input. So, you have essentially you have broken up the logic into these five different steps. Now, if you write it like this as we have shown, then what will happen is that first suppose the input is read, which will cause a which is supposed to cause a change in the output. Now, now note that these are actually nothing but internal variables, this D, C, B, A, these four are some just internal variables, they are, they have no, they are, they are just you know memory variables. So, when you will evaluate output, you will use the old value of D which was computed using the old input. So, therefore, output will not change in this cycle. However, similarly C will not change because it is because and, and, and D also will not be out, will be updated because we are, we will use the old value of C. Similarly, C will not be updated. Similarly, B will not be updated. However, A will be updated because now you have got a new value of input. In the next cycle, this changed value of A will cause a change in B, while C and D will still remain, C, D and output will still remain unchanged. So, in this way, just because we have organized these programs in this fashion, we will get a 5 scan cycle delays between an input read and an output change, which is completely unnecessary because if we had organized it in, in, a, in a slightly different way, then what would have happened? Suppose we just invert the order, then in the first cycle input will change A, so A will get changed in the first cycle. Now, when we evaluate the second one, we contain the new value of A because we are taking it from the memory and the memory has been updated. So, and 
Similarly, when B is updated, C will be updated. When C is updated, D will be updated. And so in the first cycle itself, output is going to be updated. So this is something to be remembered that the program flow should represent the actual uh, flow of logic that is what causes the other when one is developing uh, uh, relay ladder uh, programs. So now we let's let's look at some of the elements which occur in a relay ladder program. So the simple elements of a relay ladder. Today we'll look at there are various kinds of elements. Today we'll look at three kinds of elements. Namely, we'll look at the as we have already seen that there is an there, that there is an output coil at the end, and we have also seen that it is like two rails, then some logic, and then finally an output coil. So this is logic. Now today we will study where the logics are just made of some input and output contact. In fact, they can be made of many things. They can be actually these input and output contacts are you know those who have studied digital electronics. They are like combinational circuits. While we could also put other elements in this within this logic to make this logic a sequential logic. Using timers and counters and things like that, so that we'll see in the in, in the next lesson. Today we are going to see circuits which are made simply of various kinds of switches, so basically combinational logic. So uh, oh, before we change this, we must mention that there are now these switches are of two types. Some of them are called input contacts, so they are they correspond to these contacts are physical, you know, they are abstractions of real physical input. Like some, some photo detector has detected a part. So it has changed from zero, it has gone to one. So that one of the, so an input contact will correspond to the physical photo detector device. Similarly, there may be a limit switch or there may be a pressure switch. So these are, or there may be a push button which the user pushes physically the maybe the operator pushes. So such contacts will be called input contacts which are externally exercised by the machine that means external to the PLC and which are real that is there are corresponding to these contacts there are real physical devices. On the other hand sometimes we will use some memory variables as contacts for example as we have said that we can have we can use some value of the output coil suppose the the output coil value of the ith rung we may use in the in 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 the jth rung so how are we going to use that so we so this so to to sub to, to use the value corresponding to the, to an output coil we will create an create a contact such contacts are called auxiliary contacts so they are they have no physical they have they have no physical existence they are simply just memories okay and they are used actually for logic evaluation and they are exercised when an output coil is energized so these auxiliary contacts correspond to output coils and finally an output coil is a, is also a corresponds to a physical output in the real external world so now, so these are the three elements with which we first will, con will construct our simplest uh, PLC program. There are, we'll, we will use two types of contacts. The first kinds of contacts are called not no contacts, they are NO contacts. NO means normally open. Similarly, so th this means that when the these contacts are not energized or they are in the, you know, they are unexcited or de-energized state, then these contacts should be should be assumed to be open, because we always interpret PLC logic as if some switch is going to open. So we 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 are always looking for closed path 
on the RLL program. So when the when that contact will, for example, when when a push button is not pressed, if it is represented by an NO contact, then when it is not pressed, that that contact in the RLL ladder logic is going to remain open. So we must interpret it that way. Similarly, we might have an what is known as an NC contact, where NC stands for normally closed. So the same push button, if we represent it by an NC contact, then if the push button is not pressed, that is when it is not excited, that contact will remain closed. So we must interpret it that way in the PLC logic when we try to see whether there is a continuous path from the from the positive rail to the output coil positive end. So it is open when energized and it is closed when de-energized. Now we, we, we will look at a very simple example. This is an example which is it's a, it, it's, a, it's a simple version of an example which is used typically for let us say motor control. So imagine that we have a motor and we want to, there are, there are two push buttons, one says go forward, so the motor will rotate in one way. It could be a movement of a motor, it could be a mov movement of a plunger in the forward direction. Similarly, there is another push button which says go in the reverse direction. So how is this achieved? This is typically achieved by if current flows in, so maybe, maybe, maybe there is some solenoid somewhere. So if this is positive, this made positive, this negative, current will flow in this way and then the motion will take place in one direction. On the other hand, if, if this is made positive and this is made negative, then current will flow in this way and then probably the motion will take in the other direction. This is the way it is done. So therefore, sometime you have to connect the positive terminal to, to this point and sometimes you have to connect the positive terminal to this point. Now a potentially hazardous situation exists, that is if by chance there are two different switches, if they are pressed together, then what is going to happen is that the positive terminal and the negative terminal will get shorted. This may cause an accident. So we want to have a logic, we do not feed the push button directly rather than we take it through a PLC so that we ensure that even if they are pressed together, no such problem will occur. So now we see what, what is going to happen. So you see that the, these two push buttons corresponding to each push button, we have two contacts. So corresponding to the first push button, which we called IN001, we have two, uh, corresponding to IN001, uh, yeah, okay. Now, you see, sorry, this IN001 is actually a master control switch. So nothing will happen. The, see, see, the motor will not rotate either this way or that way if, unless this switch is, if this switch is pressed. So th this is like an, this is like an emergency stop, you know. This motor has three modes. So it has a mode move forward, it has a mode move reverse and it has a mode stop. So if this is actually a stop switch. So you see that and these are the two output coils which you can say symbolizes the arrangement of switching the power supply to either the positive and, and, and the negative. So when this goes becomes 1, when OP001 becomes 1, then the motor gets supply in one way and when OP002 becomes 1, the motor gets supply in the other way and when both are 0, it does not get any supply, so it is standing. So we see, first thing we see that these are normally closed switches and when IN001 is excited or the stop switch is pressed, then these will become open because they are normally closed. So therefore, obviously, there is no question of this positive rail, they are getting a 
continuous path to the control output coil. So both will be off. Fine. So we have we have satisfied that condition that is that is the stop switch is pressed, it's going to be one. Next, suppose the stop switch is not pressed, so it is off. Now, now if we press, suppose this is a push button, this is let's say forward. So if this is pressed, now you see initially both are off, so therefore this is also on and this is also on. So when this is pressed, this will become on and there will be a continuous path to the output coil. So this is the forward coil and the motor will start moving forward. Now note that this is an auxiliary contact. So the moment this gets supply or becomes one, this is going to be excited. So this will be closed. Now even if you remove this switch, it is a, it is a, it is a, it is a push button. So you, you have to, you have to, you have to press it and then you can release it. You can't keep holding it. So you press it once and immediately, even if you leave it, the motor will keep running. This, that, that's the arrangement that we have to make. So that is made by this parallel path. So after this has become on, even if this becomes, again this becomes open, there is still a parallel path and that parallel path is this one. So this forward coil continues to get supply and the motor continues to rotate. Now in this position, when, while the forward coil is on, suppose somebody presses the backward coil or the reverse coil, what is going to happen? So then this will become on, but interestingly nothing will happen that this coil will actually not get supply because of this one, which is another auxiliary contact. So whenever this is on, this becomes excited and this becomes open. So this will be open, which means that even if th this is already open because this is off. So even if this is becomes on, there is no the continuous path stops here because this is open. So therefore this cannot be excited while this is on. If you have to excite it, you have to first press the stop switch by which both will become off. Ex this time you can press this one. Then this will become on and similarly when this is on, you cannot press, you cannot make this one excited. So this is a standard forward reverse interlock which ensures that Simultaneously, you cannot command the motor to move both ways. To, before we end, let us let's look at another example. So what are the elements? So the elements of the example are the IN001, which is the stop push button, IN002, which is a forward run push button, IN003, which is a reverse run push button, and uh, the output coils are forward starter and reverse starter. And the auxiliary con there are auxiliary contacts NC and NO also corresponding to the these. So there are NC, there is one NC and there is one NO. Oh, I'm sorry. Anyway, that we have studied. So now let's look at the second example. This is our old you know die press, and we know its behavior. We have seen it in the uh, in the earlier lesson. So now we have to design a controller for it, a, a control logic for it such that whenever a die is, that is whenever some switch is, master control switch is play, pressed, it keeps on going through a cycle, okay. So, uh, so we, we will see its simplest version. So, you know, it is very similar to the forward reverse control because here also there is a forward reverse motion. Only thing is that, so you have a master control switch again. So if the master control switch is, if the master control switch is, if it is master control stop, this kind of emergency switch. So if it is flicked, then this machine does not work. So neither up solenoid nor down solenoid will get supply. That is fine. Now initially, suppose the uh, the press is in the is in the bottom position. So the down lamp that may be a that may be the parking position or the shutdown configuration. 
we are not discussing how it will come to the shutdown configuration. We are just saying that from the shutdown configuration, if it starts, I mean, how does it start? So because the down lamp will be made, so this will become on. The moment and uh, so initially, now initially, uh, yeah, down lamp is the so what will happen? So it's a, it's, it's down, and because the down solenoid is this, uh, because the down solenoid is uh, because the down solenoid is off. So therefore, this actually is we should have this as an NO contact. So then this will become on. It will become uh, no. It will become uh, now. Nah, oh right. So so right, correct. It, it 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 is an NC contact. This is this down solenoid is off. So therefore it's closed. So when the down lamp is closed, immediately the up solenoid will get immediately the up solenoid will get supply. So when the up solenoid gets supply again, again this will become this is an auxiliary contact. So it becomes it becomes on. Now there is a path through this way. Note that as it moves, so immediately when the up solenoid is on, the press will start going up. And when it goes up, the down limit switch and the down lamp will glow, will open. So even if it this opens, but the up solenoid will be on and it will keep going up. Now the point is that it must stop somewhere. So when it will reach the uppermost position, at that time the up lamp will glow. When this will be glowing, this will become open. So then the up solenoid will become 0. So now the up solenoid becomes 0, so therefore this is closed and the up lamp has, glown, has grown. So this is now closed. So immediately the down solenoid will now get supply. And when the down solenoid gets supply, this is closed and the down lamp is, is anyway not excited. So therefore, it will start coming down and then the, then, the, uh, then the up lamp will open. But still there is a path in this way and the down solenoid will keep getting supply and so the press will keep coming down under hydraulic pressure. So you see that using another contact, we have, we have just ensured that there, is, that there is alternating motion. So these are the two uh, examples of uh, RLL that can be constructed with simple uh, contacts. To review the lesson, we have scan we have seen three major topics. One is a one is a PLC program execution. The second is we have seen the simple RLL programming elements of NC and NO contacts and input and auxiliary contacts as well as output coils. And finally, we have seen two simple RLL programs uh, which have shown that how to create interlocks and, and how to create alternating motion. There are some points which you could test questions or points to ponder. For example, what is the difference between the execution of programs in PLCs and that you could write in a normal PC or a microprocessor as we have seen that the difference is in the way, in way input output is done. What is the basic difference between normally closed and normally clo open contacts and input and auxiliary contacts and you could, it will be interesting to see that what could be possible defects, we have the, the die press controller that we have given is a, is a very simple controller, what could be possible defects with it and fi finally, it will be good if you can try and try to draw your own RLL program for the control of a pump to keep the water level in a tank below a mark. So imagine that your, your, your house, in the house you have put some PLC control such that you would never run out of water and it will sense the water level. So a very important part of part before designing the RLL is to identify the inputs and the outputs of the controller, what sensor you are going to use. What, what are going to be the outputs of your PLC, etc., and then try to write the RLL program. So that is all for today. Thank you very much. We'll see for see the next lesson in the next class. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome to 
today's lesson, which is lesson number 20 of the course on industrial automation and control. Today, we are going to look at some new uh, programming elements, namely timers, counters, etc., which are required for RLL programming. We are going to understand their meanings and see their use in real, uh, simple but real typical industrial programs. So, before we get on, we take a look at the instructional objective, which is to, so that a student will be familiarized or he will be able to describe various types of timers used in relay ladder logic. He will be able to describe a counter. He will be able to uh, construct RLL programs for uh, simple problems involving these timers and counters and he will also be able to be familiar with some program control, data transfer and uh, arithmetic instructions which are required in just like in any program you require if then else statements which are program control statements, add statements, you need statements for moving data from one location to the other. So, here also you need uh, such constructs. So, for writing complete programs they are sometimes necessary. So, we will get familiarized with some of them. So, we have come to the end of the lesson and in this lesson we have uh, seen the various timers and counters and we have also seen some arithmetic that data move and program control operations and finally, we had uh, seen other you know macro operations like a sequencer, there are sometimes even other some other continuous mode operations also like PID etcetera which we have not seen so far. So, coming to the end we have the usual points to ponder for example, you could try to modify the die press controller such that a, a delay is introduced between that is after the master control switch is put on and the up solenoid goes on there, there, there is a delay. You can try to put that by modifying. Similarly, you could also modify the die press controller such that the number of die press cycles is actually counted. So, you say that after every thousand presses you want to stop the machine and you want to maintain the machine. So, you want to count every time. Uh, a complete cycle of die, there is one going up and one going down is completed. And you want to count them and after you the, it reached a, it reaches a count you want to you want to stop the machine for maintaining. Similarly, you could improve the RLL program which is uh, which we said in our earlier points to ponder RLL program for control of a pump to keep the water level in a tank by introducing a hysteresis in your on off control cycle and the or and also sampling the water level every 30 minutes that is not continuous sampling, sampling the water level every 30 minutes. So, that is all for today, thank you very much.